Well, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the 2019 Annual Business Meeting of Jacksonville Onslow Economic Development, also known as the Committee of 100. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Joey Carter. I'm the current, current chairman of the Board of Directors. For those of you that do know me, I'm Joey Carter. <laughs> I started to say I was Mark Sutherland, but I'm not even sure I want that to be half true. But anyway, that's another story. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to acknowledge a couple of special guests that we have with us today. Um, Miss Janet Bradbury from Senator Burr's office. I said, there's Janet. Welcome. Good to see you. <clears throat> okay, so I've only got a few instructions that I was given before I got up here, and I've already messed up one of those, right? So please hold your applause until I've introduced everyone, and then we'll give them all the appropriate recognition. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Royce Bennett with Onslow County Commissioners. Bob Warden with the City of Jacksonville um, Council, um, Mayor Anita Dingler with Holly Ridge, and Mayor John Davis from Swansboro, um, Bob Williams with the Board of Education, and I don't believe Miss Pam made it. I have not seen her. Um, if you would, please now give all of these folks the appropriate thanks. <laughs> At this time, if you would, we're going to have our invocation, and then we'll follow that up with a Pledge of Allegiance. If you would, please stand, and we'll just move right into the pledge. <laughs> Father, we just want to thank you for this day. We thank you for this great community of Jacksonville and Onslow County and the privilege that we have to live here. We just thank you today as we... Do business in the name of economic development, of developing wealth and prosperity in our community, making it just a better place to be and live. We thank you for the food, ask you that, that our bodies be nourished with it, and we just pray above all that everything that we say and do today will be pleasing and honoring to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, unviable, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Please continue to um, enjoy your lunch, as well as the uh, dessert that we have. Um, we do have a full agenda today. We do have a little business to conduct, but we're going to get going and move quickly. I'd like to call our 2019 annual business meeting to order. We do have a quorum so that we can conduct business. And our only item of business today is to elect directors for a 2019 to 2022 term. Our organization is led by 18 elected officials and 20 ex-officio directors. Obviously, there are a lot of other investors, but those are the folks that operate as our board of directors. Um, and these folks give unselfishly of their time and energy uh, to direct us, to direct our efforts in terms of economic development. And I, and I will say that even currently, we're undergoing the development of a new five-year strategic plan. Um, so there's a lot of additional effort going on maybe than in normal years as we kind of set that path for where we're going over the next five years and even into the future. The 2018-2019 Board of Directors are listed in your program, but I'd like to particularly thank uh, our departing directors and would ask um, if, you, if you folks will, you gentlemen, as I call your name, if you're here, if you please stand. Um, Mr. Billy Sewell, Mr. Bob Dickerson. General, stand up. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, Mr. Ed Garris, Frank Irwin, and Steve Wangren. Thank you. Give these guys a round of applause. Thank you for serving. 
We appreciate your contributions to Joe Ed, to our community. I know each of you have served in multiple capacities. Um, there's not a community meeting that takes place that the general is not at. I don't know why that is, but he's always there. But we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for all your service. Now, <clears throat> we'd like to move on to um, electing officials, our, our next directors, to serve for that 2019-2022 term. The nominating committee has nominated the following people, and please stand as I call your name and remain standing. Ms. Kawanda Bazil with Express Employment Professionals. Jeff D. Clark with Marine Federal Credit Union. Ray Evans with REMAX Elite Realty Group. Wendy Fletcher Hardy, Atlantic Coast Trucking Incorporated. Richard Jefferson, Coastal Bank and Trust. Scott Riggs, First Citizens Bank. These are our nominees from the nominating committee. At this point, I would open up the floor for any additional nominations, if there are any. We have a motion. We have a second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor of closing the nomination, say aye. Those opposed, nay. These are our nominations. We can take a verbal vote at this point. All of those in favor of accepting this slate of directors for the 2019-22 term, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, thank you for agreeing to serve. You're now locked in. <laughs> Now that you've all sat, I'd like to ask you if you would please stand again along with all of our 2019-2020 directors, those currently serving for the upcoming term and those of you newly elected. Would all of our directors please stand? Thank these folks for agreeing to serve. Thank you. Thank you all. And with that, my work here is done. We will <laughs> Doc, that wasn't, that wasn't on your instructions. Um, we are, we've concluded our business. We'd like to move on now to a very special presentation and to introduce the next phase of our meeting. I'd like to call up our uh, executive director, Mr. Mark Sutherland, to induce, introduce our panelists. Mark. So could I ask our panelists, please come on down, watch your step. Okay, so thanks again to everybody for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, we've assembled an incredible panel, and by the time they're done, you're going to agree with me that it's, it is a it is an incredible panel, and everyone has a very compelling story to tell about things they've been through and learned in the last few months uh, since, since Hurricane Florence visited us. Uh, bef before we introduce them, just a couple of fun facts to know and share. Uh, the, state, the state says that North Carolina businesses suffered $5.7 billion in losses as a result of Hurricane Florence. One billion of that in property and equipment loss and 4.7 billion in losses due to business disruption. Our Onslow County businesses were, in many cases, the face of that loss. To some degree, all suffered damage to property, equipment, inventories. Uh, their workforce was dislocated. Uh, they had interruptions to their supply chains, lost communications with their customer base, and myriad lost opportunities just because of the sheer weight of recovery. Uh, so we've asked these folks up here to share a bit of their story with you today for a couple reasons. You know, first, so that you might glean an understanding of the kinds of pressures disasters like Florence place on our businesses and their workforce. And secondly, so that the lessons they've all learned 
about preparing for, experiencing, and then recovering from a disaster like this can be shared. This panel's going to warn you, this panel's going to move along really fast, and uh, with the talent we've assembled here, I'm sure there won't be enough time afterwards to handle every, the, all the questions that you'll have for them. So we've asked them to stick around afterwards to interact with you individually, follow up on uh, issues that you want to discuss a little more in detail. We've set them up over there on your left uh, at those tables over there for after this meeting adjourns. Okay, so let's get started. Ready, Tim? I'm ready. <laughs> okay, Winter Custom Yachts located its operation in Onslow County in 2017, starting with 10 employees. So the company now has since grown to 43 employees. Uh, they're, they're involved in all facets of, of boat construction from design to delivery. They enjoy a global <clears throat> client base, building and selling really nice boats from 23 to 72 feet long, valued from 800,000 to $6 million each. Their 60,000 square foot facility suffered extensive damage during Hurricane Florence, including loss of siding, roofing, and insulation. Advanced preparation, long days of cleanup, and emergency repairs helped business recovery efforts after the storm, but many permanent repairs are yet to be completed. Please help me welcome our first panelist, Tim Winters. Well, thank you, Mark, for, uh, for the introduction. And, uh, you know, it's nice being here. And, uh, and I'll tell you, I'll forewarn you, I'm a, I'm a carpenter. Uh, this is not a, I'm not a public speaker, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to come here. And, and I got to say that um, it, it's an awesome experience to be part and be here in Onslow County. Uh, <clears throat> just a little bit of background about me. Um, I was born and uh, raised here in uh, eastern North Carolina. I'm actually from uh, Cape Carteret, and I grew up down on the White Oak River. And so, you know, just thinking about, um, you know, hurricanes and how, you know, we got affected. Um, that, I mean, that's something that, that I, I had a... Uh, I had a pretty good idea going in, you know, how that the hurricane would apply to us. But, you know, just looking at the company as a whole, you know, the company, we got started in Apex, North Carolina, and I'd been there for the last 10, 10 maybe 10 to 12 years. Um, and so um, last, basically, February, we made a decision that we were going to relocate to um, Onslow County, and we found the facility that we're in now in Hubert. And so <clears throat> that was a three-month process for us to get there and get set up and start getting the guys back to work, get our projects relocated, get them moved. Um, and then as we as we made that move, that transition, which is a, was a big challenge for us, um, you know, we finally get plugged in, and the next thing we know, we got a hurricane barreling down on top of us. And so, you know, it was immediate, basically, um, it's time to get to work and start preparing. And so um, the main advantage of us moving and making the transition from Apex to Swansboro was to offer us a boat yard. You know, we build new sport fishing boats and that's where, kind of where I hang my hat. Uh, but the boat yard is a, uh, is a place that offers us the ability to be an all-inclusive, uh, fully encompassing, uh, company, so we can service boats from all around the world, service our own fleet as they're starting to age and get older. Uh, we can refit, we do repowers, anything from the smallest little paint touch-ups to the, to the most extensive uh, refits and repairs. But, you know, having that boat yard and where we're at now uh, in Hubert, um, it really showed, it, it put us in a position to help a lot of people, um, to help people with the hurricane preparedness and hurricane haul out. Um, so, you know, as Florence was kind of barreling down on us, you know, we had anticipation that we were going to maybe have, you know, 15 to 20 to 25 boats uh, that we were going to haul out. Um, and it just so happened that with the intensity of that storm and the, um, you know, with our client base and everybody else, people were paying attention. And we noticed right out of the gate that uh, we had four phones in our office and it's like ringing off the hook night and day. I mean, and it's like people are just really going overboard to make sure they had a plan in place. And so, uh, you know, my initial estimations of 20 to 25 boats that we're going to deal with. Now, when I say 20 to 25 boats, these are anywhere from 40 to 70 foot boats that we were going to, uh, to haul and put up on the hard. But, um, you know, that 20 to 25 easily went from 35 and then it was 45 and then it was 55 and then it was 65. And finally, I'm like, holy cow, this is getting, this is getting out of hand. So, um, you know, all we had to do was, uh, uh, 
you know, scramble and uh, we had to get equipment and we had to get tools and jack stands and blocks and all that. And then we ran out of blocks, so we had to go cut trees down and go to the sawmill and start sawing and turning stuff into uh, timber and cutting stuff into blocks. But, you know, my guys, you know, they worked above and beyond and, and we saw the need and we jumped in there and we just, we just wanted it. We wanted to do an awesome job. We felt like we were new we were fresh, we wanted to let people know that there was another option and that we were willing to basically go above and beyond and, and, and that's definitely what we did. Um, and so four days before the storm, um, you know, we're still trying to build new boats, we're still trying to do that, but we're also trying to provide the service for everybody else and give them this place where they can haul their boats. But four days before the storm, you know, we're working 14, 15 hours a day hauling as many boats as we can, because now we gotta go from zero and haul 64 boats. And it takes us approximately about an hour and 45 minutes to two hours to, um, to haul a boat. And so, uh, I mean, we basically, you know, we selected you know, approximately 10 to 12 guys in my crew who could uh, who'd be willing to stay and they could send their families off. And so that's what we did. We shipped our families west and uh, we made a commitment that we were gonna ride the storm out and stay at the yard and, and protect the boats and do what we needed to do. Um, so, uh, so that's what we did and we stayed there. We didn't protect our homes or anything. We, uh, you know, we stayed there and got all that done and, uh, and got the boats up and, and we actually stayed at the yard with, our, with the boats and our, our new boats um, throughout the whole duration of the storm. And which I'm glad we did because we had a lot of issues that kind of arise that uh, if we weren't there, then we would have had some, some catastrophic losses for sure. Um, specifically, you know, we were worried about storm surge and storm surge wound up not being an issue at all for us. Uh, but the wind and the duration of the wind and how it impacted the boats and we had a tower blow off and other stuff, um, but we were there. And so uh, that, was, that was really good. Um, as far as new construction, you know, we were impacted because we had to pull guys out of the shop. I mean, you know, first thing we found out was 10, 12 guys wasn't enough. Next thing you know, we got 20 guys scrambling around and we got guys going all over the place to buy and bring materials to us. So um, it was, it was an all hands on deck situation, you know, trying to prepare and, and get ready. And, um, and, you know, me and my business mind and, and new construction, you know, I'm kind of freaking out because, uh, you know, when you bid boats and you do the boats like we do, uh, some clients don't really necessarily really care about a hurricane. They just want to know that, you know, we're building up a boat and it's going to get done. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to balance that. And, you know, I'm watching, I'm watching a lot of time go by. I mean, we blew a week kind of preparing and then we lost a week after the storm. And so, you know, post storm, you know, we're sitting here looking at, we get the opportunity to look at the damage and everything else. And we, we suffered substantial damage to our structures. We got 180,000 uh, square feet of manufacturing space. And in that space, um, we, we lost portions of our roof. We lost siding. We had 20 by 40 foot roll up doors that got completely <coughs> blown in. And we got an assembly line going down our main construction bay. And, and that's where our roof got peeled back. And we're, the next day we're shoveling water and insulation out of you know, multi-million dollar budget. Boats. And so, uh, you know, that was, that was definitely unexpected uh, at that point. Uh, but I think the biggest hurdle for me and this company was, you know, a lot of our folks left and, and just to flee and get out. And, uh, you know, we stayed, but, you know, those folks, they couldn't get back, you know, so that's another six to seven days, eight days. And so there we go. That's two weeks of production time that's lost. And, um, so, you know, we start making the rounds and, and checking on people's homes. How, how did they do? And as most of y'all probably saw, it, it was a similar story throughout Carteret and Onslow County. Shingles peeled off, roof lifted, you know, water penetrated all the roof, and you go in there and the sheetrock is dropped out of the house and insulation over. I mean, it was like numerous. I think I, had, I think I had 11 employees who had the exact same thing. So then it's like, holy cow, you know, we got another situation on our hands. Not only, you know, are we losing production time, but we ain't gonna be able to get people back to work for a long time. And, uh, and some of our employees are, you know, they're paycheck to paycheck. Um, so we made the commitment at that point to like sell them, look, don't worry about money. You know, we can do anything. We're boat builders. We, if you ask me to go to the moon, I feel like I'm gonna get you there. And so I think we have that ability. So we kind of put our tools together, brought everything together, and, um, and we started kind of plugging in. And, and eventually it took around two to three weeks uh, before we kind of got families back and we get them stabilized, whether it was just moving, picking up their lives and moving them into somewhere else, or hey, pulling sheetrock or putting tarps or whatever. We did it all. And, and for anybody who helped during the storm, you know, I mean, you went to a street 
and you started at a house and you couldn't leave that street. You can't go help one person and leave three or four people. So we would just take the guys and we would start at one house and we would just kind of work down the whole street. Next thing you know, we're there for two or three days. But, uh, but nonetheless, um, it, it was, uh, I was, that was quite the learning experience for me, um, you know, being a new, um, new to this area. Even though I was from here, I'm still new back home. And, um, you know, it, it, was, it was a challenge getting all these guys back up and running. And, and eventually it took, it was, it was actually six weeks before we had our first day at 100% attendance rate um, across the shop. And, and even still, even to this day, guys still have to go deal with roofs or whatever. Um, but, you know, we definitely learned how to, you know, be prepared. I mean, on the front side, you never know what you're getting into. Um, on, on the back side now, you know, got a little better idea. You know, we spent a lot more money and how to be more prepared for a storm like this. Uh, but um, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was quite the experience overall, just to see how a community comes together. I remember when we were sitting there, you know, it literally it was tropical storm force winds and we're trying to haul a boat and get it out. And I look over, we don't have any Jacksons again. And I, there's like three people putting Jacksons together beside me. And I'm like, who are these people? These are my neighbors. They're neighbors that came over in our golf cart and saw it still working. So I think the takeaways of this is just how awesome you know, you can take a catastrophic event like what we had, right? And then we just kind of laid down everything that we were doing and just people plugged in wherever they were um, and just helped out completely. And so, um, but eventually, you know, we got past the storm and, and you know, we, I think we showed a good commitment to our employees and they appreciated that. And, and that loyalty from a business owner like myself, um, I can't, I can't buy that. I mean, I appreciate that more than anything in this world, you know, to have somebody. And I, I, I enjoy that opportunity to be able to show them that I do care for them. And so, uh, you know, I think uh, I definitely, uh, you know, just looking back, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was not, you know, I don't want catastrophic events to happen, but it was a time that, that we all came together and, um, and everything worked out at the end of the day. And, um, and, you know, I, I definitely look forward to, uh, you know, maybe helping again or however capacity we can plug in. But, um, you know, I have a lot to say. I'm out of time. But, uh, but anyway, I just appreciate, you know, Onslow County and everybody here and Mark and Sheila and, and everybody who's, who's been so um, supportive and helpful. And, and every time we turn around and need to get whatever assistance, um, whether it was recovering from the storm or whatever, it's just been, uh, it's been a team effort across the board. And, you know, we have this cool ability to build these really cool boats. And, and I'm blessed every day to get to do that. And so um, I hope that Winter Custom Yachts can be a, a light, that it's a bright spot for Onslow County. And, um, and I think of it as Swansboro. I know it's technically Hubert, but, um, you know, I, I hope that, you know, it's something that we hang our hats on because we do build some of the best boats uh, that I feel in the world. And so uh, I'm, I'm proud to do that. So thank you again. Thank you, Tim. I think you're fine at public speaking myself. <laughs> of those 65 boats, how many blew over in the storm? Uh, none. No, that's yeah, right. No, we didn't have any problems. Not everybody can say that, right? That's true. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Okay, Concentrix is a customer engagement call center. They're located on Western Boulevard in Jacksonville. They have 550 customer care agents and 50 on-site managers. Uh, and they specialize in serving clients from the healthcare, transportation, and hospitality industries. Damage from Hurricane Florence closed the facility for four weeks, <clears throat> and of course, a flooded parking lot. Did you have white caps on that at one point? <laughs> yeah, it added to the challenge. Site Director Veronica Perez and the Concentrix Incident Command Team managed to keep operations going by transporting workers daily to other facilities in Fayetteville and Greenville. Building repair and office space renovation took many months to accomplish, but they're nearly complete and operations are back to normal. Please help us welcome our second panelist, Veronica Perez. Thank you. Um, I'm not a public speaker either, and that will be evident. <laughs> so um, so these, we always prepare for um, 
challenges with natural disasters. You know, we plan for this every year. We do these drills, mock drills, um, to help us prepare for um, hurricanes or any kind of um, catastrophic event. And so we kind of had, um, we've dealt with hurricanes before. I mean, I've been with Concentrics for 22 years, and I've always been in this location in Jacksonville. And so um, Florence was very different for us. We never had the amount of structural damage that we had with Florence. And it wasn't because we flooded, but it was because it was just a poor quality roof and um, water just got in the building. And we were, um, so we knew that we were not going to be able to open up right away. And when we first um, learned about the, um, uh, how the site was or the condition of the site, we knew right away, well, we have two things to care for. One is our employees and making sure that they're safe and everybody's okay. And the other one was our customers. Like we still had customers who want to know who was going to be taking those calls. So we got really creative. I mean, this was not on our um, plan, but we were like, okay, there's sites around us and they have available seats. So how many seats can we get so that we can move some of our employees into those sites to work every day? And so um, we called up a local charter company, it was Sun Charter, and every day it was like, I need another bus, I need another bus, and uh, 55 passenger buses, and we were filling them with employees. Um, we were in, I think one of the key um, parts of our success was communication. Like from the time the storm hit, um, we knew the storm was coming, so we already had phone trees in place. And so from the time the storm hit, um, calling people and just cascading those calls down to all of our employees and finding out if everybody was okay. And then we had to call them again to find out, okay, who's ready to come back to work? A lot of people weren't ready. A lot of people evacuated. But who was ready to meet me at the site at 8 a.m. to get on a bus to drive to Greenville until 6 p.m. and then drive back for another almost two hours? Um, so we were trying to find people. And let me tell you, that was not hard. People were like, sign me up. I need to make money. So we were able to um, find different locations. We even for a week sent people to Charlotte. We have a facility in Charlotte where we put them up in a hotel. Um, well, you know, and made sure that we provided, you know, they didn't have their own cars. So making sure we provided um, food for them and snacks. Um, so we did a lot of creative things. I mean, technically the site could have been reopened probably within three weeks, but we knew it wasn't the right thing to do because it wasn't safe. Um, we needed to make sure that we were structurally sound and we needed to make sure that there was no more mold in the building. And we had to tear up a lot of our carpet. We had to replace a lot of our chairs, the cubicles. Um, so again, we could have done it faster, but we needed to make sure it was done right. I had one guy tell me, you probably have the cleanest air in Jacksonville right now because we were so insistent on having our air quality tested because we had people in the building uh, moving around technology, um, trying to move computers from one site to another. We brought in a lot of air scrubbers. Um, and every week, um, we were making sure that we were testing our air quality in every part of our building and putting emphasis on areas that um, didn't have good results. And so uh, it, was, it was a very emotional time, I think, for me, for all of my agents, for my managers. But when we brought people back, they were so um, happy with us. They thought, you know, we knew it took a long time to come back to work, but thank you for being in touch with us, like communicating with us every day. Um, and it's hard to do that with, you know, over 500 employees, but we did. And we didn't lose a lot of people, people, because we kept in touch with them. And we were giving them, we didn't commit to a timeline yet, but we were letting them know we were going to open back up again, but we wanted to make sure that we were doing it the right way. So there was a lot of um, appreciation from our employees. We were able to help them out too with um, some like stay bonuses to make sure that they were able to recover also from some of the losses, financial losses that they saw from the storm. Um, <clears throat> but then what I found out is that um, they were doing their own communities within their own teams. So 
our structure is that a team of agents has a team leader, and they were like meeting each other in parking lots to help each other out. So you don't see a lot of that. I think in really large spaces where you have five, it's hard to make personal connections with 550 people. But I think that um, we really did a. I'm really proud of the work that my team did. Um, and the, the healthness of everybody to get together. I mean, as soon as the storm hit, we immediately um, assembled our incident command team, which we meet to talk about timelines. Are we ready? Is our generator topped off? Do we have um, sandbags at the doors? Did we cover all of our equipment? And so, and I'll just say this too, um, we, none of our technology, we, I think we lost maybe six computers, and I have 649 seats in my building. So that we only lost six computers because we were trying to think ahead. I and mean, we've been through this before. We know our roof occasionally gets leaks, and so we covered everything. We covered it with plastic, which was um, a tremendous help in terms of being able to move people to other facilities because we were able to take our existing equipment. Uh, I was calling people and saying, hey, can you meet me at the site? We need to load up cars with um, imaged computers so that we don't have to rebuild computers in, computers in another site to support this program. So <clears throat> it was a lot of creative thinking. It was our facilities team, our IT team, who was absolutely amazing during the storm. Um, our HR, our, op, our ops leaders, um, the people who support me, our corporate incident command team, and then just the support of the people in um, Onslow County, just getting calls from you know, Sheila or other people to say, hey, did you guys make it okay? Are you going to be okay? Are you gonna open back up? Um, just making sure that uh, people touched bases um, with us um, along the way was um, really nice. And the fact that we were able to call on local resources to help gut the building, to help um, charter our people to other sites on such short notice. I mean, that was pretty amazing um, for them to be able to come to our call so quickly. So um, just, it was just, a, it was, I hope I never have to go through that again, but um, I did learn a lot uh, during that time about things for me, things I could be doing differently as a leader, um, things that we could do preventatively to keep that from happening again. So we've had a lot of rain since the storm, and we haven't had one leak in our building, so that's been good. But um, And just you know, making sure that people came back to a place that was clean and safe and that they knew that. And it didn't, it didn't look pretty right away. We still had like plastic draped up on certain parts, and um, we said to the uh, people who were helping us rebuild was, um, we don't need to be 100%. Just what can you do now? You know, like maybe it's just the front half of the building. So we kind of staged it that way. And it was creative. We had to move seating around. But um, but it, was, it didn't have to be all or nothing. And even when our employees came back, we still weren't um, fully put back together. But they knew that um, we were, that we took the time to care for them, and they understood um, the delays. I and mean, everybody was very appreciative of be us being able to bring them back to work as quickly as we did, um, even though it was, um, it was quite some distance for some of them to have to travel every day. But um, again, I was, uh, actually, I was um, recently offered a relocation opportunity, but I just can't imagine leaving um, my site here in Jacksonville. I was like, well, who's gonna be the site director here? And they were like, well, you know, but we need you somewhere else. But I just, you know, with um, the resilience and the um, strong team I have here, I just couldn't imagine it. So I'm happy to be part of this community and to be a large employer for um, the people here in um, Onslow County. Thank you so much, Veronica. You know, um, we went around and checked on all of our existing industries in the wake of the storm and, and uh, saw varying degrees of preparation plans being executed, uh, I mean, from zero to what you just heard. But uh, in every instant we saw our employers taking care of their workforce, like we, you wouldn't imagine grills going out back because people didn't have food at home. They were given food, they were given three meals at work you know, and uh, and uh, and NC Works was a was a big partner in in the unemployment assistance that was available to dislocated workers at the time. So a lot of good things going on 
in the community. I'm sure uh, everybody's disaster preparation plans will get a little tweaking in the next couple of weeks before the next hurricane starts, uh, 1st of June. So we're gonna uh, shift a, a, cup, a, a gear here, at least one, maybe two gears. Uh, last fall, I got a call from Steve Yost, our partner at North Carolina's Southeast. That's him. And uh, he said, hey, I ran across these folks, uh, and I think you, you might wanna know they exist. And that's how I met uh, uh, Alex and then Jeff and Jade, their partner. Uh, so I want to start by introducing strategic response partners. Uh, they work with long-term clientele, both public and private asset owners, to develop comprehensive emergency preparedness plans long before the threat of a disaster. Once it's forecast, they mobilize equipment and manpower to their clients' threatened sites, coordinating efforts to protect people and minimize property loss. I think it was about a week before Florence where your tractor trailer started rolling in. About five, six days prior. Yeah, yep. yeah. So the, after the event, they develop and they execute the recovery plans based on whatever kind of damage happens. And, and they, their, their goal there is to result in a speedy return to pre-event conditions. SRP24 is an investor in Joe Ed, and their clientele here in our area includes Villa Capriano Condominiums, St. Regis Resort, Swans Point Shipyard, New Hanover Regional Medical Center, and North Carolina Ports. Sitting next to, to uh, Alex is Jeff. Thank you for being with us, Jeff. He's with Skyline Adjusters. And Skyline Adjusters, uh, public adjusters, they consist of hundreds of the most experienced public adjusters in the industry. In business over 50 years, they operate from 41 locations across the country, including our very own uh, here in North Carolina office in Charlotte. They serve public and private sector clients covering a wide array of losses such as flood, wind, hail, hurricane, mold, asbestos, vandalism, maritime and aviation, cyber attack, information systems, equipment breakdown, business interruption, and contents loss. And I could go on. I had to abbreviate that a little, Jeff, sorry. <laughs> Skyline's also an investor in Joe Ed, and their client list here in our area includes homeowner associations, uh, condominium complexes, resorts, and industrial facilities. So our next panelists are Alex, disaster response coordinator with, with strategic response partners for the past nine years. <laughs> and Jeff Major, President and CEO of Skyline Adjusters, who is one of the nation's foremost experts in property claims and forensics building damage estimating with more than 25 years of experience. Please help me welcome Alex and Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been doing this for around 27 years. Uh, I've, I've adjusted and worked hurricane claims from the Florida Keys uh, to the islands. My team has done stuff in Guam, uh, uh, Northern California, Seattle, Laredo, Texas. I will say that there is a unique characteristic of North Carolina and Onslow County specifically of, and, and you heard it from these guys, of not a what am I entitled to, I'm in line for what I'm due, but how can I help, what can I do? And, and it, it shows and it, 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 there's, there's economic development and there's, there's the business side of, of life and then there's the personal side of life and, and you guys have it down pat. It, it's really impressive and, and with even going into condominium association annual meetings of, of people that are not gonna have their units ready this season or likely next season and not hearing the complaints but hearing uh, is there anything we can do and, and how can we do it is, is really a testament to the success of, of your area and, and the pulse of, of this area. Um, Alex and I are gonna combine our, our presentations in, um, in four categories, one is three plus months before an event, a, a few days before an event, a few days after, and three plus months uh, after an event. Uh, three plus, the plus is key. Uh, we're working on uh, Katrina cases for the Attorney General of Mississippi. So, so these things seem to have a, a long tail sometimes before everything really gets worked out. But we're gonna focus on, on items that, that really are gonna give you 
um, some insight and some things to think about for, for how your business runs and how you prepare and respond and, and maybe um, some insight into doing things a little differently or tweaking some things to, to know that you have a better chance in the next, uh, in the next storm for recovery. The, the title of by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail is an important statement because it means so much in not just your business or your investments, but in the community as a whole. Um, so three plus months before is your business plan and, and your insurance coverage. It's everything you should be thinking about and all the things you don't even know to think about that some of you are learning or learned in real time you know, it's great to have a plan. It's great to know that everybody's going to show up and help. But if everybody evacuates and can't get there, you know, there, there, there's some, some things that you have to revise. Um, in the period, months, years before an event, your insurance coverage is an important component of your recovery. And in the evolution of insurance claims and evolution of insurance, what we're buying today isn't what we th think we're getting or, or isn't, may not match to what we are actually buying, what we actually have. And we're gonna go through a couple of those items uh, and specific down here, uh, wind-driven rain sublimates, co-insurance penalties, um, uh, law and ordinance for code upgrades. These are things that when you go out and you buy an insurance policy and you say, how much is it? Understand that the, you don't buy insurance on how much it is. You buy insurance on what your need is and what, your, what the item that you're purchasing. And that what you buy, what you're covered for, and what you're able to recover establishes what you do which also establishes a baseline for future claims. So we're gonna go through a couple of those, a couple of those items. And in the baseline of your next storm, what you do today, if you're entitled to a new roof and put a patch on, the next storm comes, you're only entitled to a patch because you have patches. So there's, there's, a, there's a cycle that keeps going and, and, and continues to degrade values of properties and businesses as they go through them. The very, very biggest thing you need to do as a, as a property owner or a business owner is have a real comprehensive business plan. And Alex will go through some items. How many, if I might ask, how many people in your own property? When I say property, commercial property. Uh, out of the owners that own commercial property, do you have a comprehensive business plan for business interruption, for let's say a safety plan what happens if my business goes down? What if happens if I do have a, a hurricane? Is there a plan in place, a disaster plan? Hands, show of hands. How about now after the hurricane? I'm, I'm really glad we're here today. <laughs> I'm really glad we're here today. <laughs> I guess the first thing that we found to be the most important prior is making sure that you've got everything in place as far as documentation. What the property looked like before the storm. What damage or wasn't there any damage? Because later on, being able to explain to the insurance company that say, hey, listen, we think this was pre-existing. I've got pictures and documentation that show otherwise. Having someone to be able to come in and help put that together for you, exactly what to look for, is, is crucial, especially in a recovery. Someone explained to me a long time ago what a disaster, a fire, flood, hurricane, tornado, whatever it may be. The best description he gave me, and to this day I still stick with it, it's a crime scene. 100%, it's a crime scene, whether you're the victim, your neighbor's the victim, the entire community is a victim of happenstance, a storm, whatever the case is. And because you have insurance, everyone here, Stroke the check and said, okay, I'm covered. And you believe that you're covered. And I hate talking about insurance policy because that's not my specialty, but I realize how integral important that is for me to be able to do my job. I need to know that the coverage that you guys have, so when I show up with my team, my team is basically the ones that bring in the resources. I'll come in, I came in five days before and uh, literally came in, I knew no one 
in Wilmington. And we have a meteorologist that, frankly, used to work for NASA for 25 years. He was the guy that said, listen, the space shuttle can go up. No, it can't. Here's when the space shuttle can land. We hired him on board to give us minute by minute tracking of the storm. And he said, ground zero, five days before, will be Wilmington. I said, are you sure? He goes, 100%, Wilmington will be ground zero. All right, five days before, we drove into Wilmington. And I called, got on the phone, literally called every property management company, property owner, commercial broker. I found one that actually took my phone call. I said, I can help, I have resources. Nobody wanted to listen. I had one individual, and he's actually here today, Hanson Matthews, uh, was able to put me in touch with the hospital director, the port authority. I mean, individuals that really could make decisions at that time to say, hey, listen, we can help. I introduce me and be able to meet with the hospital director and in real time, hey, I've got resources. What, what is it you guys need? We were able to bring in generator capacity for them that they didn't have. And at the time, they weren't expecting uh, flooding they were expecting a wind event, and then it switched over to obviously a flood event, as everyone saw, but roof was peeled back. We had personnel there on site during the storm, and a phone call came and said, hey, can you help us right now? We're, we're, we're leaking right now. So they didn't have a real comprehensive disaster plan. They had a phenomenal team. Their entire community came together, brought everyone to the hospital, but having everything properly documented. We had a film crew literally go in through the hospital, go on the roof and able to document everything for them. So when that goes back to the carrier, they've got great evidence saying, well, there was no damage. This is what the storm did. It makes it a lot easier to be able to make that point later on for someone like Jeff to be able to take that piece of evidence and say, no, you owe me for the roof, genuinely. Our job through SRP is to bring in the resources and then part of it later on turns into evidence gathering. I'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, I want to be able to speak on that for the baselines so you understand sure. what that means. And so the plan in, in a case that you have a vendor that's coming in ahead of time, that's part of your business plan if your intent is to document what it is before. Right. Um, having a, um, a, a, an evacuation plan, you having, you guys know that there's a bridge and they're not gonna get over the bridge. Once they leave, they're not coming back. So part of your business plan should include knowing who's going to evacuate, who's not going to evacuate, having a team who is going to respond to an event, not just the people that are going to show up and batten down the hatches and, and clean the roof off and take pictures, but for the, the having the vendors in place, have, finding out from them, we have a contract, you're showing up, what is the time period that if you don't show up, I'm relieved from the contract to call somebody else? Who is gonna be your communicator for your claim? Who is going to have your, who's gonna be the liaison for the insurance company? Where is your data stored? Where is your policy stored? Where are your leases and your business transactions stored? So your business plan should be the, how we're responding to the physical plant, how we're responding to the operation of the business, where we're gonna put people, what we're gonna be able to service, and then um, the San Juan Airport set up as part of their business plan a daycare in the airport so their employees whose kids didn't go to school anymore could show up to work and put their kids somewhere and actually get work done. So your business plan should incorporate what your employees or your associates or whoever you're gonna rely on are, are going to, what they're gonna do and how they're gonna do it and where they're gonna live and stuff like that. There's an acronym called your lab work. L-A-B, lawyer, accountant, and broker. When you buy insurance, is it consistent with how you do business? Do you, does your lease say that the other person's responsible for it but you're paying insurance for it and they don't have insurance for it? So getting those people together and knowing that you have a business plan, knowing what you're insured for, and having a team focus on the policy you have, CP10, CP10, if you have a commercial property and it's a CP10 policy, water's not covered unless it comes through an opening caused by wind. There has to be a physical opening. Wind-driven rain's just not covered. 
So if you have this policy that you saved $4,000 a year on that doesn't cover you for the $2 million worth of damage you have, it, it, so you need to, in your business plan, run through these things, do your lab work. So there's, there's entire two-day, three-day conferences on disaster plans. And, and you should, in, in your disaster plan, be as comprehensive as possible and try to put a team together. That's three plus months. The days before, it's a quick review your disaster plan. Run through it. Are you still okay? Like being the guy who's showing up, and if the guy says to you, "No, actually, we're we're leaving," <laughs> sorry, I quit. You know what 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 what's happening? So you should review your disaster plan at that point, and then focus on the evacuations, and and the documentation. Right. So Alex's team, we'll when, basi we'll basically come in for the most part three days, four days prior before if we have clients in that area. If we don't, it's who else we can meet in that area and kind of go over. If they do have a disaster plan, anything in place, we can help shore that up a little with resources, personnel, things of that nature. But a lot of times we're trying to put together what kind of communication. Like Veronica's communication was phenomenal. What we've noticed now is we're using satellite phones now on every single major loss that we come into because we anticipate losing power at least for a week. And if I don't have any power, that means the cell towers probably went down too because that's how they're powered. Down here, that four day rain event, stopped everybody from coming in. So there was no equipment coming in. I remember we were in a parking lot and we had a Chinook helicopter come down and that's how we were unloading medical supplies and food and everything for the hospital. That, that's how they had to do it. There was no other way to get it in here quickly. At that point, communication broke down all across the county. You're looking at power loss. So what's that plan? How does that plan look? Here's the other thing, that something that we realized was key moving forward, all these people, all these people that are employed, employees, what's the plan for putting them back to work? Well, when we come in with equipment, trailers, we come in with all of this, a lot of times we can keep bringing equipment in, but we can't necessarily bring in personnel. Well, if I've got trailers of equipment and I've got damaged buildings that need work, I've got hundreds of able-bodied people that I can gladly have our companies hire on board and give them employment right there on the spot. So that's something else that we've really kind of ramped up and it was, it was really beneficial having that. And Jeff said it earlier, and, and just a short, very short, doing losses all over the country, Puerto Rico, just your community has probably been the most welcoming community I've ever been in. I remember our team, no, honestly God, our team, for the first week in Wilmington, I can't remember paying for a meal, and there'd be seven or eight of us sitting around the table exhausted, and we would just, no, the meal was covered. What? That, that's exactly how welcoming it was. We couldn't pay for a meal for the first week down here. Your community was be, beyond welcoming, so I really thank you. That was honestly got the most heartfelt when you couldn't pay for something on your own. But so um, it, let me get one, one yeah. more thing. Th this is uh, something else that we, uh, and I, I don't want to say it was the test bed here, but it was, it was absolutely the test bed because we realized how important that documentation was prior to the storm. All the buildings that we had, we put up drones, surveyed prior, got all the imagery. This way the insurance carrier had nowhere to go to say this was pre-existing. No, 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 72 hours before we did all the hospital, the entire hospital network, all their facilities, so we would have the images. Then the day after, we sent our drone team out and redid them again so they had the before and they had the after within 24 hours to be able to show. So this is something else that we're bringing forth with all of our clients at this point. Get a drone survey out 24 hours, 72 hours before a storm or a major event and then have it done right after. Even if nothing happened to your property, keep it there because you don't know. All of a sudden have a roof leak and you wanna be able to show the difference. That is so crucial to be able to have that. Another component of your business plan and, and documenting pre-loss conditions is designate a person to be the um, liaison the, the, yeah. the, the, and the keeper of, of photos. So pick somebody's cell phone um, and when you send out the maintenance guys to clean the drains ahead of time, have them take a picture of their, with their phone and text it to a designated person. So you have the ability in your pre-plan to say, here is a, here is a telephone number 
and you can text everybody that please send all of your photos of the property that you take to this number and that person can download them to the computer. So the data that you may not know as a business owner that exists, that somebody took a picture of something is, is, is useless if it's not somewhere. And if it's in their phone and they're just walking around with the proof you need for your claim, it, it, it's a good thing to have that set up. So you wanna make sure that your plan has the ability to have something in there where any data that's collected goes to a place that, that you, can, you can keep it. Um, so we've done three plus months before, days before, immediately after, there's, it, it, the biggest thing to do is just safety. It's, it's not worth walking through running water. It could be six inches, but it's enough to suck you under a car and keep you there until the end. Um, walking through still water that's two inches deep. If there's a sump well in the middle of a floor and you step in it, then, you know, so, the, so safety is the biggest thing, electric safety, and getting in the, the emergency people to make things safe, like you said. Um, the, the other thing immediately after is it's part of your business plan, part of your lab work, but to immediately review important dates. They're in your policy, it's in writing, it's... The, the law is, is, is specific about you following your requirements, about you doing your, your due diligence. And the, the important things to, know to, to, to be ahead of everything else are a proof of loss requirement. Your policy says that you have 60 days some policies, a lot of policies are, you have 60 days from the date of loss to submit a sworn statement and proof of loss. Some say 60 days of our request. You need to know that ahead of time to know if you're compliant. Uh, some policies say that you have to notify the insurance company in writing of a loss to be compliant with the policy. And you call your agent or your agent shows up, says I reported it for you, doesn't relief doesn't relieve you from that obligation um, and then there's a suit clause date so you have one year to file a suit or you have two years in some cases if your claim's not settled but you're working it out there's no reason to file a lawsuit but you do have a limit so you can most insurance companies will agree to toll or, or, or save off that date so you still have time to settle your claim. They're really, really, really important dates for business and for, for you guys to understand. Um, and then your next piece right after a loss is your emergency services. It's bringing in the people to do emergency work and for, as Alex was saying, I need to know what your coverage is. The reason he's saying that is because if you have a limit of $10,000 for mold, are you going to remediate and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in remediation to dry something that's coming out anyway? So there needs to be an immediate assessment in the emergency services for a conscious decision of this is where we're covered. Right. And do we have a sublimit for wind-driven rain? If we do, his guys or your remediation company guys have to come in and separate the cost for drying the wind-driven rain damage or drying the, the regular wind damage. Because if it's all put in one lump, then it disappears and that limit disappears quickly. And this so, is why I'm working kind of in tandem. Every vendor that we have knows that whatever report you put into that carrier goes through us first, goes through Jeff first. One of us has to take a look at it. Here's why. Putting in one wrong word, as, as he said, if the word, and I hate saying this is such a dirty word in our industry, mold is in there, and you have $2 million of damage, clear as day, water damage, but you have a $5,000 cap, $10,000, whatever that number is, and a maintenance guy, somebody put in an email, somebody put in a report the word mold, came back, it was all moldy. You just got a $5,000 claim, there you go. They'll hand you a check happily for $5,000. On your $2 million of damage, they're going to give you 5,000. However, 
if we can put in, here's the $2 million of water damage that we still had to tear out the same way and do the same exact cleanup protocol we would have for the mold, now you get $2 million to be able to clean up your $2 million worth of damage. You see why having those vendors in place, having someone that can control, that, at least know what's going on from the beginning. Because most of the time, the way insurance policies, I, I've read insurance policies, might as well be Chinese. And I'm in this industry, I've been doing this nine years, I have no idea half the time what they say. I send them to him, I send them to Jade. I don't know what this says. So they are able to handle that portion of it. But the boots on the ground, when that decision right there needs to be made and that maintenance guy is talking to, hold on, come talk to me, let's have this conversation. Before we go anywhere, here's where we're gonna steer this to make sure that that claim gets paid. Nobody here wants to stroke a check for all the damage that they have, do they? There's a reason you bought insurance. I make sure that whoever I bring in follows those protocols, knows how the coverage is applied, and any of the information that has to be given up is given to him to be able to present to the carrier to make it look in our best possible light, not to give them the advantage. That's it. And, and by the way, you can say to your insurance company, we're, be very clear with them. Yeah. We know we have a mold limit and, and it's wet, so we don't want to have an uninsured loss. <laughs> they know you don't want to have mm -hmm. an uninsured loss. Just let them know ahead of time and this is how we're doing it. So under documentation, you, you're taking your photos, you're saving your photos, a, a log of communications with the insurance company and everybody is important. And you should designate one person to be the liaison with the insurance everything and for that person to, to monitor everything and track everything. Um, and your, your immediate photos, your long-term photos, all your data, keep it in one place, share it with the insurance company. Um, next is three plus months after, you guys are living it. It's a mess. You, you get through what you can. It, it, it's, it's, you have an obligation in your insurance. Uh, just very quickly, because we're out of time, but how many people are letting the insurance company come in and say, this is what we owe you? It, it's very common to rely on a process. The, the policy says in writing that you have an obligation to present your claim. If you don't present your claim, you didn't present it. So if they missed something, it's not because they you know, are trying to do anything. They're a burden too. You're not presenting a claim, so we'll write one for you. So do you want the IRS to fill out your tax return? They'll do it for you. They really will. <laughs> so, or do you want to present your tax return? Look at your claim that way. Look at your damages that way. You have a written obligation. I have times where we've said to insurance companies, yeah, we'll present a claim to you. It's gonna take about two and a half months. There's 850 units. We have to get through every one of them. No, we're not interested in your guys doing it. We'll do it because we're supposed to do it. So you can do that. The next key point, everything you do now is going to affect your next claim. Matthew happened, Florence happened. There's a possibility there's gonna be another storm. If there is, the first thing that's gonna be said was, oh, we need a copy of what you did from the last time. What did you do with the money we gave you on the last time? If you didn't do the roof and you didn't do this, you're going to be prejudiced moving forward. And the next is just simply the process. The adjusters, the experts, there is a process. Make sure it's explained to you ahead of time and the expectations are there. Our company relies on SRP for experts. They're really a good resource. <laughs> so if you, if you need, if you feel like you need somebody looking at your roof that's looking at it from your perspective, go get the expert, bring them in. If, if you feel like, like you need, your air quality should be clean, call in somebody and test it. You know, make sure you have people that are not biased or don't have an agenda or aren't paid for by a protocol that could reduce your damages. Make sure you're doing it and you're documenting it and you're presenting it. Yeah. How about this? We got, I know we're out of time by far. We appreciate you guys very much for taking out the little extra time. If anyone has questions after and we want to get more in the detail, some of the nuts and bolts of what we really do, we'll be here for a little while answering so any questions we can help with. Yeah, so we have a few minutes in the pro built into the program for some questions. I know some folks in here will have some questions for 
for all of our panelists. Teresa and Kelsey have mics. I'd ask you to, to raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, they'll bring you a mic, and uh, we'll get on with that. And again, we're going to run out of time before we're done with questions, and we'll just continue after the program. Anybody wants to interact over there one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, while you guys get set up, so I have a question for you, Jeff. Uh, earlier today, you mentioned the 91% figure. Can you elaborate on that? So um, 18 years ago, a company called McKinsey & Company is a consulting group. They started an engagement with Allstate, and their actuaries gave um, Allstate a, a prediction of if you say no, uh, and no is in many forms, no is... Maybe you shouldn't put a claim in because your insurance could go up or, or, you know, this is all we pay. FEMA only allows for this. That's a form of no. Um, there was a prediction of uh, how humans would react when in a situation dealing with their insurance company and the ratio of people who would go away when you say no. The numbers that was predicted was 91%. 91% of people take the offer, 91% of the people go away. And 18 years later, the historical data supports the 91%. And the ones that stay get more. Now, ironically, out of the 9% the, the that stay and fight, 91% of them go away on the second no, because they feel like they got something farther and the no's change. So, the business of insurance, the business of indemnification has statistics that are, that are pretty solid and consistent, and it affects the way the business of insurance operates. And, and if you feel in a claim that you think something's not right, just speak up. You know, don't be the immediate statistic of, oh, okay. You know, if FEMA says they don't pay for all the stairs, they pay for all the stairs. <laughs> if they say they don't pay for the subfloor under the wall, they really do. And same with your insurance company. If they send out an, a team of estimators, we have claims where the insurance company sent a team of estimators out that spent three months at a property, and then the insurance company completely abandoned that work product because it was bad. It was bad data. And that group that has that that claim, if they were part of that 91%, would have said, okay, and they would have had a uninsured, not an uninsured loss, an, underpaid, an insured and underpaid loss of probably three and a half million dollars. So, so it's, the statistic's important, it's important to know, but it's, it's out there, and it's, it's historical now. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Alex, I have one for you. Uh, you've done hundreds of these Florences, and you've helped thousands of entities with preparation and recovery. Yes. What would you say are the low-hanging fruits of preparation with, with regard to physical damage, things that people could do physically to prepare that generally aren't done? For roofs, clearing out scuppers. I mean, that's probably one of the key ones right there. I mean, at least getting somebody on the roof and seeing if there's any debris right there on site it makes it so much easier when your roof gets flooded. Getting anything off that could go flying as soon as you have something that's not tied down, set, remove, whatever, you, it becomes a projectile. And it becomes a projectile for the window, the roof, and as soon as it tears into it, that's it. And frankly, at that point, the carrier could even make a claim saying, hey, this was negligence on your part. Or if the maintenance isn't there. That's another thing, too. If you have property and you're not doing the maintenance, at least having somebody get up there once every year or two to make sure that it's in good condition, it's your fault at that point from the carrier's perspective to be able to say, you didn't take care of the property. And, and they would have ground to stand. So those two things right there, maintenance is probably the most important thing. If you're gonna do anything before a storm, make sure that year, two, six months prior, when, when it's slow and the season's down, have somebody get up there and document it. Somebody licensed, insured, have them go up there, have them document what they did, everything, and keep it somewhere. And keep it, you paid for it, whatever, because later on when the carrier asks, no, I did the proper maintenance, here you go. That's important. So that would probably be the one thing. Yeah, there is a Google Earth photo of your property mm. at some point in time mm. that that stain looks like your drain was clogged. <laughs> um, so if you have something that says, well, three days before, seven days before, 
we went up and cleaned it. So I don't know when that photo came from, but this is from, there's a text from our maintenance guy. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing it internally and you're not using a roofer, you're not using somebody, have a checklist for your own maintenance guy to go. Make it a piece of paper, take a picture of it. Um, and then low-lying fruit for preparation for business interruption. The, every single insurance company for business interruption, extra expense, they ask for the same thing. Three years tax returns, your leases, your, 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 your vendor agreements. Uh, there's a, a, a lotto machine or there's a machine that's, that's a lease that you're not responsible for. Have all of those great agreements. Email them to yourself because you can find them later or put them in a Google Drive or somewhere that you can evacuate, go somewhere, and still be able to provide that data. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you both. Any questions from the floor? We got the mics out there. So if not, Tim, this one's for you. You're down there on the water, literally on the intercoastal waterway, and uh, you got beat down pretty hard. There was anything about Florence that caught you off guard? Not, not really particularly other than just, you know, our employees and our workforce and, you know, getting them back to work. And I'd anticipate that it would be six weeks before, you know, we had a full team back together. Um, so I, I think that's the primary thing that I didn't anticipate. Did that lead you to change your preparedness plans for this season? Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, as much as we can, uh, for sure. You know, I think, uh, I think a lot of our employees and our people are, are better positioned, you know, as well. I think it was kind of across the board. Thanks. Veronica, you guys had great plans for years and you run, you run drills every year. Same question. Anything catch you off guard? Um, well, just the, the fact that we were out for so long, I did not anticipate that at all. I had um, no idea that the site was so wet. Um, so uh, we were not, I did not, I mean, we knew that the parking lot flooded and people had taken pictures, but um, just really no idea that we were coming back to um, the condition that the site was in. So that, I think that really caught us off guard. and. I don't know how we could have prepared for that, um, except to be more, you know, like I said, have a, you know, we have a good roof now, but I don't know what we could have done um, differently in that scenario. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Susan. Uh, Jeff, is there any kind of, a, of a time frame requirement in insurance? So, for instance, I mean, I have folks who are still dealing with claims at this point, right. and they still haven't worked it out, and they're arguing. So, um, it, it's a great question. So, the, there are timelines, legal timelines, if you submit a sworn statement proof of loss, the insurance company has 60 days to, or 30 days to accept or reject. So there's timelines there, and the suit clauses are very important timelines, providing that they met the, the policy requirements if they have a proof of loss requirement or something like that. In timelines of settling claims, when I'm asked the question of how long is this gonna take, and I, I'm not gonna hold you to it, but just, I just what do you, what's your professional, what's your best guess? My answer is, is imagine how long it could possibly take in your wildest dreams, and add three months. <laughs> and, and I've never been wrong yet. So it, it's, it's the process. So there are times where you have you know, 250,000 claims that come in in, in a 72-hour period. You have adjusters that are coming from all over the United States, and they want to see 16 properties in a day. That adjuster is going to do an initial report, and Florida happened not by, and he's gone. Now the next adjuster has to come in. So there, it's, a, it's a process that's not a great one. One of the things that's important for the people that don't have their claims settled yet, didn't put their new roof on yet, or didn't make the repairs yet, is to be conscious of temporary repairs now that will get you, if you have a blue tarp on your roof still, it's probably time to put a new blue tarp on or some plywood up there or something that is a better solution to go through this hurricane season. Um, because they're not going to pay you for the same damage twice, but you don't want more damage. So you can take better temporary measures or put the insurance company on notice and say, 
we are trying to get this claim settled or we want to settle this component of our claim so we can put our roof on. Or, or, so um, insurance companies, when they come up with a number, they have an obligation by law to give you their undisputed number. So if, you're, if they're negotiating a claim still and a payment hasn't been made or there was an advance but they're at 240000 and you think it's four, they owe you the two forty now. So you should take that money and do the dry in things and do the repairs. Now if part of the argument is on the roof and you took the money and you actually did it, the better, you have a better chance of getting paid that higher number on the roof or the right number on the roof. So there's no real timeline of all claims have to be settled by this date. As I said before, we're still working on Katrina things. Um, so, but but there, you should be mindful of the suit clause and, and knowing that when that one year anniversary is coming up that you should ask the insurance company to toll that clause for every one of those people. Thank you, any other questions from the floor? If not, Mr. Chairman, this concludes the portion of the program. Turn it back over to you, sir. Thank you. We'll give, give you guys a brief break. You can step down until everybody attacks you after we're done. Thank you all for being here. Um, an event like this, our annual meeting, doesn't take place without considerable effort on the part of many folks. And we just want to say a few quick thank yous before we get out of here. Um, I'd like to particularly recognize and thank our staff, Mark and Sheila and Teresa, who work tirelessly all the time, but especially in preparing the annual meeting. Um, thank you so much for all that you guys do. We really appreciate you. We, we recruited some additional help today. would like to recognize those folks, but Melissa Maloney and Kelsey Stiglitz from the Chamber of Commerce, thank you ladies for helping out. You saw them at the check-in. And Kelly and Tim from the county, Kelly, excuse me, Kelly, Tim, and Chad from the county for helping set up and presenting everything. Thank you to them and for the county for the facility and letting us use this today. So thank you guys so much. Our sponsors for today, and I believe those folks are on the slides that we've been showing throughout the day. Maybe we'll put those back up, but thank you to those sponsors. Um, as well as all of you, our investors, thank you so much. Obviously, Joed doesn't exist without those investors. We can't do any of this without all of you. So thank you so much, our board members, um, all of our officers, particularly our elected officials that are here today. Um, thank you all for putting on your flak vest and uh, deciding to enter into that fray of public elected service. Um, it is a, a thankless job many days, I'm sure. Um, but you are appreciated. We thank you all for, for what you do for our community. Thank you for being part of our organization. And with that, we will consider our 2019 annual meeting adjourned. Bear in mind, our panelists are going to move over to my right side of the room and remain around for as long as you want to pick their brains. So we thank you for being here. Have a great day. We are adjourned.